and it's another Monday, which means time, gentlemen. Oh, oh, gee, you took a drink too fast. You got to you got to raise your glass, raise your glass, because we are sending a salute out to the men and women who keep us safe while we enjoyed the weekend. On behalf of the men and women here at Stacking Benjamins and the men and women of Navy Federal Credit Union, big shout out to our troops. Let's go stack some Benjamins, shall we? Thanks, everybody. Is this your place? No, 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 no. No, I live with my mom. Oh. Yeah. You hungry? Hey, Ma! Can we get some meatloaf? Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. How long is your commute? five, six hours? Well, today, you're going to hear from someone who survived that, a horrible paying job, giving birth to twins, and not one but two weddings, and still created one of the internet's top money sites for women, the founder of Clever Girl Finance, Bola Sukunbi. Plus, think your retirement is A-OK because you're saving into your plan at work? One major publication says that might not be enough. We'll explain in our headline segment. In today's TikTok Minute, let's turn that money you're saving into $5 million dollar bills. We'll then throw out the Haven Lifeline to Marissa, and of course, I'll share my smiley trivia. And now, two guys who would walk 500 miles to help you with your money. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. And a happy Monday to you, stackers. So glad you're here with us because we've got a great show for you today. Glad you made it. You found us. Sit back and relax because this gentleman across the card table promised me before we hit record that he's bringing it today. Like he thought he brought it before. Oh, no, 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 no. He is bringing it today, folks. Mr. OG is here. Yes. Yes. I have brought, brought I am, I am bringing is it. this what it is is this what bringing it sounds like from you <laughs> this will be it will be, it will be brought in on a scale of one to four <laughs> a solid two baby a two 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 and a half better than most days but we got a great show because you know who's bringing it today og bullis succumbi the creator of clever girl finance is back super excited she's here going to talk about times of transition Man, I remember when I was struggling with my career and Cheryl and I find out that we're having twins and uh, she talks about controlling what you can and personal accountability And man, Bola is going to bring it today. Can't wait. It's the only thing that you can control is the stuff that you can control. My logic is unflawed. <laughs> I think that's why, why we, uh, you need to get an honorary degree from some institution. There's got to be somebody from some institution here. Well, as long as it comes with a... Student loan forgiveness package, I'm in. Perfect. We got a fantastic show. We're actually going to talk about that later in the week. We're going to talk about the income repayment plans that have uh, come with this new package and what to do about all of that. But not today. Today, we got Bullis Sucumbi. We got some headlines about retirement planning. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes from the Wall Street Journal. It's written by our good friend, Veronica Dagger. Retirement planning means more than saving into your 401k. Transitioning into this next stage of life takes introspection. Not just financial planning, retirement coaches say. It turns out, OG, as you dive into this piece that Veronica wrote, you know, planning your money is one thing, but she goes on to talk about how uh, that's not really the big part. The big part is it takes you a full two years to transition into retirement and the coping. False. And, I, and, I will prove this wrong. <laughs> Challenge accepted. The, cope, <laughs> the coping and the time management skills, like the same time management skills you had when you were working. There's so many people that just forget all those. It goes out the window and I would say, well, according to this piece, you get nine or 10 months in and you feel pretty unproductive. And then that's when the yeah. cycle of doubt begins. And man, retirement planning so much more than just the numbers. It's kind of interesting because I wonder if it's a lot like how summer planning goes for us. 
at the beginning of the summer, you know, because my kids are young and we go to Michigan for a little bit to hang out with grandma and grandpa at the lake. And, you know, we always have all these, like, all this stuff that we're going to do. And we do, like, a third of it. And I wonder if, from a retirement standpoint, if it's kind of the same thing, you get kind of, like you said, nine or ten months in, you're like, I was supposed to play golf all the time. I was supposed to go fishing with my buddies. I was supposed to travel the world. I was supposed to hang out with my kids. and gr-. Like, all I'm doing is I'm caught up on Yellowstone. got that going but i haven't done any of this other stuff well that's the tough thing she says in here that there's one of the biggest things people don't expect is that your friends that you thought you would spend more time with they're they're still busy doing the same stuff they were doing before and often if you're somebody that retired early which are a lot of people that listen to this show try to retire early they forget that their friends still have a full-time job and that they start coping with this idea of what do i do with myself like it is, it is a big struggle. Well, and especially if you retire earlier and I know Doug, you've thought about that and, and Joe, you've thought about it and I've thought about it as well. It's like, if, if you're not careful and you do something silly, like retire early, who are the people that you're going to be hanging around with? You're going to be hanging around with all the retirees, all the 70 year olds, all the 65 year olds. You know, if you, if you retire when you're 50 yeah. and aren't intentional about it, you will end up feeling pretty old and unproductive because all your buddies will be like 65 and 70 because those are the people that are able to go play golf in the middle of the day and, you know, have a late breakfast and an early lunch and all yeah, that other you sort end of up, stuff. So, you'll end up looking like a stud compared to like all their wives are all over you all the time <laughs> because you just look, you just look so virile. Well, me in particular, I know. You're yeah. the younger man, like 15 years younger. Oh, you, you should invite your friend OG to come with you. Right. To the dinner, Ooh, look dinner at the at 55 year old. <laughs> the dinner. <laughs> look at the 55 year old. The blue, blue play special. <laughs> I'm just saying there's an upside to everything. There's an upside to everything. All right. Number one is on her list take some time and experiment ahead of time. And oh, gee, you and I have, man, we've been all over this one. This is a great piece of advice. Think of the first year of retirement as a gap year, said Nancy Collimer, retirement coach in Longhorn, Pennsylvania. Use the time to explore new interests, take courses, and experiment with your schedule. Don't expect to have a complete plan on day one. I love this idea that you're not going to get it right right away and think of it as just a growth period. Love it. Yep. Be okay with making changes as you go. Retirement coach Jay Smith says to set boundaries. He said a few of his clients were asked to stay out in their jobs to help their team adjust to their departure. Often that's a good way to ease into retirement. Uh, Set clear boundaries, though, around your time with your employer. If your company's paying you to work two days a week, just work two days a week. Don't don't be like that person. We I'm I'm starting to laugh because I remember those people in high school, like my senior year, who had graduated the year before and decided, you know, they'd just come back and see everybody every other day. Wear their letter jacket. Right. To football games. Never really left. I mean, it it truly is the same thing. People talk about retirees wanting to come back and just have lunch with the gang and and uh, no, set some boundaries and get out there. I also agree. I don't know. I don't know that there's much more to add there. But you no. do have to be careful on the on the if you're going to do work stuff that you don't turn it back into another job. Absolutely. And third is to fight boredom. People assume they'll be happier when they stop working, but that isn't always the case. Said Robert Laura, retirement coach and founder of the Retirement Coaches Association. While people gain time and freedom, they may lose routine identity and mental stimulus, all of which aren't easy to replace. He said, without a plan, some end up spending most of their time, you said this earlier, most of their time watching television uh, or online, just scrolling. Other people think they should do nothing but play golf in retirement, said Joanne Waldman, a retirement coach in St. Louis. Golf then essentially becomes their job for a while, but then after a while they feel bored. And I know that, uh, oh gee, you'd probably try to prove that one wrong. Well, I mean, Golf is super fun. I have a lot of fun doing it, but there's no way you can play every day. You know, I mean, it's just, it's such a, it's such a, um, taxing, infuriating, thing on your body. exasperating pastime. Are those the words you're looking for? For you. No, for you, you could look for those words, but all you have to do is just go play Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, one weekend, and then go, I'm going to do this every day. No, you're not. You have to, there has to be some, some period of time. Although I do know people that do literally play golf every day, which I don't know how you could pull it off. Let's transition this more to money, though, because I would think that the more granular you can get around the activities you're going to do 
and really do that planning, which they're showing here is a better retirement, is a more fulfilling retirement, also helps you plan your money better, I would think, OG, wouldn't it? Well, especially if you have some some big projects early on. And that's usually kind of the common theme, I would think, having talked to people about this over the years, is that there's kind of that bucket list. The first five years of here's all the stuff that I want to get done. You know, I want to do this traveling. I want to do this project around the house. I want to, you know, whatever it may look like. I think what's really important from the money side of it is to actually quantify what that looks like so that you can put some dollars to it while you're leading up to retirement. And then my challenge always is, you know, if you're like, I want to really take that trip when I'm retired, why don't you take it now? Like, what's wrong with trying to pull it off now? Or I want to build a new deck on the, you know, on the back. It's like, well, cool. Get to it now. Enjoy that utility. Now, I know you've got a story about a a client who kind of sort of had that that experience, right? Like got some bad health news and then did all the bucket list and then went, oh, the bad health news isn't there anymore. Back to the, it was horrible back to work. You know, Absolutely you know, horrible. So. All of a sudden dumped all that stuff and went, oh, I'm going to live forever. Okay. No, man. No. Do the stuff that you really want to do. Yeah. Joe, it seems like there's a, like a disconnect between 401ks and the way we normally talk about 401ks and the type of retirement plan that you guys are talking about right now, or did I miss, did I miss the connection or is there a bit of a disconnect? No, it is funny. There's a total disconnect. I think, well, and OG, you can speak to this. When people think about putting money in their 401k, they're not thinking about these activities, right? You're just thinking, Oh, I got to yeah. save for my future self just and I got to put pick in the 10% fun. or whatever the number is. Yeah. yeah. F- find the fun. And it's a lot more than, than just finding the fun. In fact, there's a piece from investment news. This is written by Nick Della. Vedova and Jeff Elvander, inflation nudges retirement plan participants to adopt healthy habits. So now we all of a sudden have this inflation worry, maybe a recession worry, and people start going, oh, maybe I need to have some better habits inside my 401k. And the big takeaway, Doug, to your point in this piece is that uh, more and more companies are having outsiders, outside experts come in and just lead financial planning discussions and studies show OG that people that do that, people that take part in those activities through work, where it's not just picking the fun, it's much more about involved retirement planning through work actually end up with a better retirement. Yeah. Because you're tying the thing that you're doing with the thing that you want to do. Right. So there's going to be, it's going to be much stickier to say, I know why I'm contributing 10% of my 401k and I know why I'm investing in these assets because it's going to provide this level of income that's going to allow me to do the stuff that I want to do. It's very, very impactful. Recent uh, Morgan Stanley survey says that 87% of plan sponsors report that offering access to a plan advisor within the workplace retirement plan delivers, quote, better retirement outcomes for participants. Currently, about 15% of workplaces offer independent advice as a voluntary benefit, but the NFP believes that percentage of more than triple climbing to at least 15% because of some of the ugliness going on in the markets right now. People have more questions than ever. We will link, dive more into this topic, planning your retirement, how to get more granular about it and how to really have more fun with your planning by talking about the stuff you're going to do and not just the money. We'll link to, of course, these two pieces in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com, but we'll also, we'll also include a link to the 201, our newsletter where Brooke Miller dives deeper, far deeper into how to get this done so that uh, you can enjoy a great retirement. Time for our TikTok minute. This is the part of the show where we shine a light on a TikTok creator who's either teaching something brilliant or something hashtag brilliant. Uh, OG, which one do you think we got today? Definitely eye roll brilliant. It's on TikTok. Well, let's see if you're right. Uh, Our friend Sean, Stacker Sean, sent this to us. This is... Dark Trader 999, who we featured here on the show before with some other advice. And, uh, well, see if this one is is any good. Five ways to make a million in five years. Next step, go inside your employer-sponsored 401k. You're going to see some selection. Usually it's about 25 different things. They've got them in group debt, equity, which means stocks, or blended. The only thing you want is broad equity. That's probably going to be something like Vanguard or Fidelity, where they have an index mutual fund that goes out and buys all the stocks in the S&P 500. Now, not only does Jeremy Siegel say that this is the best strategy for you, but so does Warren Buffett. Go into your employer-sponsored 401k and look for the selection 
that has the lowest turnover. You can do this by going to Morningstar.com. Bam. How about that one, OG? Okay. Yep, you're right. I'm just wondering, that's not bad advice, OG, but for somebody that's just starting out in their 401k, do they even know what Jeremy Siegel is? <laughs> Jeremy Siegel says it's great. That's like if you walk up to me and I know absolutely nothing about, you know, anything and you just, well, my cousin Bob uses it. Sean, thanks a ton for sending that to us. If you've got a TikTok video uh, that you think would be great for this segment, Joe at stackybenjamins.com. Just shoot me a quick email with it. So big thanks to Sean. Hey, coming up next is uh, one of my favorite people on earth. Bola Sukumbi is a woman who she was on the show before talking about how after her dad was horrible with money, her mom had to take control of her own finances. And she learned early on that she needed to do what she had to do for herself to support herself lived all over Europe and Africa. We'll actually have a link to the first time she was here. But today we're going to talk about a time of transition in her life, the creation of Clever Girl Finance and having twins at a young age, having a job that doesn't pay. Uh, how do you get through all these things? Bola's been there and she's going to show you how to get through the same type of stuff. But first, Doug, I think you've got some trivia for us, don't you? Darn right I do. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And on this day in 1982 is the anniversary of the first emoticon being used, colon dash capital D. It was probably on the first printed passive aggressive office kitchen sign. Please remember the maid is off today, colon dash capital P. Back in the day, if someone wanted to use this hot new expression, they were likely to do it on this computer. Which hot new computer was released that year? I'll be right back after I go powder my nose. Semicolon dash close parentheses. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The computer that came out in 1982 cost a whopping $595 at the time or $1,600 in 2021. Jeez, I wonder how that compares to what the iPhone cost back then. Well, this invention was an 8-bit desktop and was the highest selling single model of all time. So, which computer was it? The Commodore 64. And that, as they say, is the rest of the story. God, does anybody even get that reference anymore? Here now to talk about navigating tumultuous times and taking control of your life, Bola Sukumbi. Bola Sukumbi joins me again in the basement. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I was so excited to, number one, hear you had a new book. And number two, I was excited to read the book. And fans of Stacky Benjamins know the early parts of this book, they may have heard some of it when you were on here before, some of the early mm -hmm. stories. Not as in detail, by the way. You go into much more detail. But I want to talk about a different part of your life while you're here, because I found this very inspirational. There's a lot of people thinking about changing careers, thinking about starting a family, thinking about weddings, thinking about, and you had all this together in one, one little part of your life, a time <laughs> of what I think was intense change. But I want to start off, if you don't mind, with a quote. This is what you write on page 63 of your book. You put, what I've learned. When I started working in corporate America... I simply settled for whatever I was given. But in those early days of my career journey, I learned that if I was going to be successful at work, especially as a woman, I needed to take control of my own trajectory. Wow. Tell me, tell me about that. First of all, thank you for reading the book. <laughs> so that portion of, I guess, my journey was, it was cumulative in the sense that at the time that, at the spot you are at in the book, I had already gotten my first job and I was now reflecting back on what had happened. And I remember getting my very first job. I was earning $54,000 in the New York City area before taxes, after taxes, which was about is, 40K. Which for people out there uh, that don't live in the New York City area is nothing, is struggle money. <laughs> struggle, hustle, 40K after taxes, struggle, hustle money. So I remember at lunch at a client site sitting with my coworkers. And that 
conversation that HR never wants you to have comes up. And it was like, so how much do you get paid? (laughs) And sitting at that table, I came to find out I was the lowest earner, even though I was more qualified in many ways in terms of my deliverables than the people I sat with. And I was the lowest earner because I just didn't ask. They had all negotiated their salaries from base pay to bonuses to moving bonuses. And I just did not ask. And I remember feeling very disappointed and also angry with myself because I didn't know. And I wish I had asked. So that was one instance where I was like, okay, I need to start taking control of my career. How do I figure out how to advocate for myself? And then the second instance was, well, another instance, there are many instances, was, you know, like being a woman in the workplace, in a male-dominated workplace. I worked in telecom and cable at the time. And being able to find my own voice. And I started to realize that not using my voice to advocate for myself in the workplace was also holding me back because people started to take credit for my work. And, you know, just they would out, go to and out, the- out and out stealing. I did this instead of <laughs> Bola did it. Yes. Wow. You know, I, I, went to a, <laughs> I went to a big meeting and my team lead presented my work as his work. And I was like, wait a minute. No, no, no. This is my work. You know, those are two instances where I was like, I really have to take ownership. So it started by talking to my career counselor, like, how can I figure out how to earn more money, given the fact that I've already started at this low point with my base pay and getting comfortable with creating those calendar meetings with my boss to talk about my performance, to talk about what I needed to do to get to that next level, securing the commitments by asking, well, if I accomplish this by this time, can you guarantee me that I will get this bonus or this raise come end of year? You know, having those conversations and being confident and showcasing why I was valuable to the company. In terms of people taking credit for my work, it meant, you know, on Friday morning before the big meeting, I send out my own status update to the whole company, including our executives. Here's what I have done, right? So Just to be all clear. Going- Just to be clear, I have done this, me. I may not be at the big meeting, but this was my idea. This was my discovery. This was my solution. These were my hours at this job. So, (laughs) yes. (laughs) That's so sad. It makes me so happy that I get to work in mom's basement instead of (laughs) in corporate America. And, And I think, you know, I mean, your audience is mostly women. And a lot of times women are afraid to rock the boat. They don't want to, they don't want to have these tough discussions. I'm wondering though, Just this discussion about sharing salaries, I saw a statistic that showed that older people, you know, you don't talk about salaries. Gen Z, largely wide open about what we make. How did Mm -hmm. you, being kind of right in the middle there, how did you get into this conversation about what we made? I feel like that might be a little awkward. It wasn't awkward because at the point that we sat down to have that conversation as millennials, <laughs> we were all friendly. We were we were now coworker friends. So it was just an organic conversation. You know, I moved from Chicago to the New York area. I moved from California. I moved from Tennessee. Oh, really? How much do they give you for the moving? Wait, you got a moving bonus? Wait, what's your base pay? Wait a minute. And that's just how the conversation grew from there. It um, slowly built. Yes, it's slowly built up. <laughs> it's harder to just directly ask a coworker, what do you get paid, right? Yeah. Uh, but once you develop relationships, then it becomes organically part of the conversation. Your your whole book, you talk about surrounding yourself with the right people. I mean, it, it isn't a top of mind theme in your book, but it resonates throughout the book. Surrounding yourself with these people, these sounding boards, these, you know, making sure that you have the right people in your corner. One person who's been important on your journey is your, your now husband. At the time in your personal life, you're not only going through all this crap at work, Bola, <laughs> you're trying to plan a wedding and you're trying to plan a traditional wedding. And tell me what this traditional wedding is for you is going to be different than it is for somebody that was born and grew up in the United States. Tell me this idea of what a traditional wedding is like. Yeah, so we actually had two weddings. We had a Nigerian wedding and then we had a church wedding. And the traditional wedding was the wedding that held in Nigeria. So we traveled. You went to Nigeria. Yes, for this wedding. And it's really a meeting of families. In my culture, it's a whole showcase, a whole 
presentation of families and the groom's family basically has to come with all these gifts and um, there's a marriage contract that is read and then they have to show respect to the families and there's a negotiator at the at the wedding <laughs> and she's basically negotiating between both families this is how amazing our daughter is how amazing is your son <laughs> so it's a lot of fun but for me as the bride I it's like a four-hour wedding and I don't participate until like the last five or ten minutes I've never been to a Nigerian wedding. I've been to a couple, I have friends that are from India and I've been to traditional Indian weddings and those are great. I sit in the back of the room for three hours while stuff I'm not paying attention to yes, is going on. The, the yeah. Is it kind of like that? Yes. It's a whole like, you know, ceremony negotiation, you know, and then, you know, my marriage contact was read, my cousin read it and she showed it to me and it said no refunds, <laughs> no return. <laughs> Final sale. <laughs> Does it mean that you you can't refund your husband if you don't like him, or is it the other way around, or is it both ways? Both ways. It's both. both ways. You're both screwed. Final sale. <laughs> That's, that's so great. But I like this. You know what I like about this idea, though? I like about this idea that when you get married, you you truly are marrying the whole family. Yes. That's basically what it is. It is bringing everybody from either side especially the elders in the family, because um, they're the ones that have the, the conversation. And the groom's family has to ask the bride's family for her hand, right? You don't just go to the dad. You have to go to the oldest member, you know, the oldest auntie, the oldest uncle, the mom, the dad. And then you have to come with your people to show that we're giving our daughter to people who are good people, right? So they come with their entourage, quote unquote, <laughs> That's so, so cool. So, and they show up with their gifts and things. <laughs> but you didn't just have that wedding. I, I think you also had one in the U.S. as well. Yes. And then we had a church wedding for me <laughs> and our friends and other family here in the U.S. So that was another wedding to plan. So two expensive weddings, um, navigating changes at work, switching jobs, right? So around that time, I had I had been working in the... New York City area that I had moved to Philadelphia for my husband's job. And then now he had gotten a job in New York and we were moving back to New York. And I was trying to find a job and then got a job six months early, was commuting to Philly from New York every day and planning these two crazy weddings and all this stuff going on. That's so funny. That, that's what I was thinking when I was reading this, Bola, was I was thinking, you've got these two weddings, which even if you're frugal about a wedding, just the fact that you have two means it's going to be a ton of money. And you're flying abroad, which isn't cheap. So you've got all no. these expenses. That's a great transition into Bola needs a new job. <laughs> so, so, so you get this. You're living in Philadelphia. You find a job. You find a job in New York. But I love the fact that you it, it looks like you're taking the bull by the horn, so to speak. You know, you're like, hey, I need to get more money. I need to get a better job. You find a job, but it's in New York and you're in Philadelphia. Like, how do you mitigate that? Well, the number one motivator was an expensive wedding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the traditional wedding is obligation of your parents. And that is not something that is frugal, just culturally. It's a big thing to marry a daughter or a son. Our wedding had like a thousand people at it. So it, and wow. it's, it's not where we're going to cut costs. It's something that every father of a daughter has been preparing for since the day she was born. <laughs> So you know the cost is coming there. You cannot put frugal and Nigerian wedding in the same sentence. It doesn't work. It's like an insult. What do you mean? You're only spending this much money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the motivator and then the white wedding, we paid for it mostly ourselves. And so we're just, okay, we need to put money in the bank. We have goals back to life, back to seriousness. Let's get with this. And then also, I just I didn't want to have that break in my finances. Like I was so used to. You know, so the last time we talked about my story of saving money coming out of college, yeah. coming from an immigrant background, coming from a background of poverty. And so there was no reason for me to have this break in income because I was moving cities. So I started looking for a job in New York as quickly, as soon as I knew we we're moving, which is about six months before. I did not expect to get the job that quickly, but I got the job. <laughs> and so I went to the interview and pretended like I lived right around the corner. <laughs> just breezed in. Had to just out. breezed in because seriously, how far is it from Philly for people that aren't familiar? How far is it from Philly to New York? So I had to drive to, I took the commuter bus. If you're driving, it's like two hours, like no traffic. But this is commuting in the morning. There's no way I was driving into Manhattan. This is like, we're talking about four or five hours one way for driving with traffic, right? 
So I would drive from downtown Philadelphia to the commuter bus in New Jersey, which is about 30 minutes. Then I would take the bus an hour and a half to Port Authority in New York City. Then I would catch the subway to my to my office, which wasn't that far. So all in all, it was about two and a half hours to three hours one way, including the waiting time, waiting for the bus, waiting for the subway, parking my car, and then coming back. So I was commuting about five to six hours a day. And I did not tell my boss. Uh, <laughs> I was leaving the house at like, I don't know, 4 a.m. I was at the bus stop by 4.30 <laughs> or by 5, <laughs> just in case there was traffic. And I was coming home at like 9, 10 at night because I dare not say, oh, I have a bus to catch back to Philadelphia. <laughs> it must have paid a lot better, though, I mean, to be worth that commute. It did pay a lot better. I mean, the monthly bus ticket maybe was about, I can't remember, around $500. It more than covered the cost. It, it definitely paid a, a lot more, but I really wanted the job. It was a good career move for me. And it wasn't until one day when my boss said, oh, so where do you live? <laughs> and I was like, oh, mm, mm. You might- actually. <laughs> you- <laughs> Funny thing. Well. <laughs> here's a little story. You might as well have said Houston. <laughs> I was like, I live in Philadelphia. He was like, what? <laughs> So he let me work from home on Fridays. Our company had no work from home policy at the time, but he would let me work from home on Fridays if there were no big meetings and there were rarely any big meetings on Fridays. So that was a saver for me. And I remember I was perpetually exhausted. Like you would think that riding on the bus is not tiring, but it was exhausting. Waking up early, coming home late, coming around to do it the next day. I watched all 80 something episodes of Prison Break on Netflix on my phone. I did some work. I would think getting out of that commute would be a prison break. I, t- I talked to strangers on the bus. <laughs> I just made it work. During during this time, this time of a lot of change, you and your husband decide that you're going to have kids. And I remember Cheryl and I having this big discussion about you know, when's the right time to have kids? And we truly planned the fact that even though we were struggling, things weren't going all that well financially, that we'd rather have kids young and then be young when they're grown than have kids, Mm -hmm. you know, then wait until we were really super on top of financially stable, like a lot of people do. With this huge commute, and I think you did this for four years, if I'm not mistaken, this huge commute. You decided to have kids right in the middle of this, Bola. Like, but I know you enough to know you're a planner. Tell me about this decision. For people in our audience thinking about, you know, when do I start a family? Talk me through that. Yes, yeah, so I just to clarify, I did the New York Philly commute for six months. And then I, okay. I switched job along the way. And I had an, and I switched to another job where I had a commute that was like an hour, an hour, 20 minutes, something like ah, that. Ah, got it. Still okay. The commute. So we decided that during the six-month commute of New York to Philly was not the right time to have kids. And knowing that we were going to be in New York temporarily was also not the right time to have kids. So when we moved now to a more stable environment in New Jersey, I was still commuting into the city. Our decision to have kids was not based around my commute. It was just based around financial stability and work stability and not having to move so much, especially with my husband's job. So that was a decision, but it was hard because I was still commuting a long way. Uh, I still had a very demanding job. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in terms of like side hustle. I was running a photography business at the time. So I was pretty much a full-time wedding and lifestyle photographer and working full-time in cable and telecom and I was traveling for work. So it was challenging and I was forced to slow down because I ended up being on bed rest at month five of my oh. pregnancy. Like. 100% bed rest. I dare you to get out of the bed mm. <laughs> was the doctor's orders. So I didn't have a choice. And I remember trying to work from bed and I would balance the laptop on my belly <laughs> and then it would start getting hot. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what am I do-? I just, I couldn't do it. So at that point, I really had to just stop and be like, wow, even if I wanted to, I literally cannot do anything right now, but sleep and watch TV for the next few months. You went to term too, didn't you? Yes, 37 and a half weeks with twins. Yeah. Cheryl and I, when we had twins, she could not fit behind the steering wheel anymore, Bolo. Her feet feet wouldn't reach the pedals. Yep, same. I was taking uh, $200 taxes to my doctor's office when I had no one to take me. Yeah. Because Uber was not quite a thing in my neighborhood. (laughs) I felt so bad the coping that she went through during that period, just being able to go nowhere. Like at some point it just drives you crazy. Yeah, I could not drive. I I remember that. Like my sister-in-law would drive from Philadelphia 
an hour and a half to New Jersey to take me to my doctor's office 45 minutes away. <laughs> but I think there truly is a lot of lessons here is that, you know, there are things that you can control, things that you influence, things that are neither. We've talked about that a lot lately on the show. And you're taking these things that you can control, right? You're taking the, uh, you're looking for a new job. You're then reducing your commute to make it better. You are deciding that I'm going to do this because I want to get married. You're deciding based on your financial stability, but the fact that you're still young to have, Mm -hmm. have a family. Like, I feel like you're, you're really trying to control what you can control at the same time you begin having this. Well, and I think it really sounds like it was about the kids as I was reading along that really your dissatisfaction with the corporate world was a little bit around the children. Am I wrong? Yes, that is correct. So I started feeling once I had my kids that I wanted to do something that mattered more. The commute was really tough on me, still going into New York City, almost two hours. So I took a pay cut and found a job that was an hour, 20 minutes away driving. And I just felt very unfulfilled. Like, I think part of it was also postpartum depression. Yeah. And just dealing with that drastic change of being just me and then now having two (laughs) babies at the same time. (laughs) You know this. You have twins. Two babies at the exact same time. Look at my hair, Bola. Bola, look at my, look at my, oh, I'm sorry, lack of hair. I mean, yes. I love my kids very much. Yeah, I I do too. But you know what, when you don't know what you don't know and you have two newborns at home, listen, and then my husband had to go to work. My mom was supposed to come help me. My dad ended up in the hospital, so she couldn't come for a few weeks. My, I got a nanny the first day. She's like, oh my God, I love babies, but I just, I can't do twins. And pass. (laughs) Goodbye. Peace out. Godspeed. How bad does it feel? <laughs> like, like, how bad do you feel about yourself when somebody goes, yeah, no, I love kids, but yeah, no, no. Listen, I cried and cried. And I was at this point was like, what does what I do even matter? I am working as a business analyst. I'm doing coding. I'm doing data analysis. Like, who cares about any of this stuff? And as my kids grow older, how do I even explain to them what I do? Why do they even care about what I do? I want to do something that's more meaningful. So I, I was, again, part postpartum depression, part just trying to figure out quarter life crisis. I don't know what it is as a new 30 something year old mom. And so I just started brainstorming, like, what could I possibly do that would be meaningful? I didn't have any intention of leaving my job because I wanted to keep my income. And I also wanted to keep my financial independence outside of relying on my husband's income because he was more than happy for me to take a break. But I, I wanted to have that thing for myself, for me. Yeah, I love the chapter, by the way. It's outside the scope of our interview today, guys. But <laughs> but if we, if we could pull it back soon, the chapter entitled <laughs> My Rich Husband. Like I did, I did the double take as I was looking through the table of contents. I'm like, I know Bola, this is going to be good. And, and it was, but anyway, yeah, that's continue. Whole other story. Get the book, yeah. Choosing to Prosper, read about my rich husband. Yes. Yes. Um, Might not be so, what you think it is, by the way. No, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's a dedication, a love letter. So yeah, I just started brainstorming. What could I do? What could I do? And I've always been entrepreneurial, right? I had a full-time photography business for seven years until I could no longer do it just because the demands of being a newborn mom. I had back issues from having my twins. Um, I used to have a retail business, uh, a bridal retail business called the White Dress Shop. I've done all these little businesses here and there. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll start a business to keep me occupied, to make me have my own little corner of the world. And I just couldn't figure out what it was going to be. I just had no idea what it was going to be. And at but that time me, I was but, blogging. But, but, but let me stop right. right there for everybody hearing, because I want everybody to hear this, is that the brainstorming piece is super important and you're not going to come up with it right away. Everybody's waiting for the stroke of genius. It's not going to come. Like you had to continue searching and searching and searching and searching and it still wasn't coming. Yeah. It took me almost. So the business idea I came up with was clever of finance. And I remember Never I heard got, of it. What is that? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I got that idea about 13 months after my kids were born So this is just endless brainstorming, figuring out what I wanted to do that I would be interested in. Everything came back to money, finances, women, wellness, because that was what I was already doing. So I had been blogging on a personal, like, Bola's Life blog, um, blogger, blogspot. Remember that? Yeah. And I was talking about saving money and investing and mindset and motivation and fashion and style, all the things I was doing in my day-to-day life as a release from work. And when I had my babies, I stopped. Because I just didn't have the time. And I was like, wait a minute. When I look back at that blog, 
all the content that had to do with money and investing and saving to splurge and creating financial wellness, they were big hits, like tons of comments, tons of engagement. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to talk about money. That's one thing that at least I know how to do well. I make my mistakes, but it's something that I'm very interested in because I'm always talking to my friends about money all the time, (laughs) about investing, (laughs) about saving, (laughs) about how to, where to find the best deal. And so that's really how that happened. But it was very frustrating along the way because I just, I felt like I just couldn't figure it out. I felt like I was lost in a way, like I was just going to work for the man with no, the only thing that was benefiting was a paycheck. And at that point was a reduced paycheck because I had taken a pay cut to get a job in New Jersey. It was a long process. It wasn't exciting brainstorming. You know how you watch a brainstorming video and you see the light bulb, (laughs) ta-da! It was not that. (laughs) But back to the idea of doing what you can control and surrounding yourself with the right people this period that everybody thinks of, you know, as magical and fun. And I remember the story bowl about Walt Disney going through the uh, new park Disneyland when he was first opening it. And the chief engineer whose firm had invested in the park because Walt couldn't pay them all the money he needed to pay them. So he did Mm -hmm. a deal where they would get a part of the proceeds. The chief engineer says, what if nobody comes? Like all these people are bad mouth in this idea. What if this ends up being a dud? And Walt turns to him and says, we go bankrupt. I've been bankrupt like five times. Big deal. And, then, and the chief engineer like freaks out. But everybody looks all romantically right at the early days. And there was none of that. But but one thing that was really good that I want people to hear is you were procrastinating along the way. Like you were dragging your feet on doing this cool thing. And it was really your friends. It was surrounding yourself with these right voices that helped you actually launch what we now know as this badass, cool brand for women. It was a friend who helped you who said, this is a great idea because you light up all the time, who like reaffirmed it. And then it was another friend who said pretty much, I mean, you didn't write this way in the book, but the way Joe interpreted it was, get the hell off the sideline, Bola. Let's go. Yeah. So Coming up with the idea of cover of finance was easy. I got it when my kids were like 13 months old. But then it was like, oh my God, this is this new thing. Who is going to care? Am I going to waste my time? Who is going to want to read this? And it was a lot of imposter syndrome, especially knowing that this is something that I was doing on a hobbyist level. And people were, they enjoyed it. The people who who knew my small little blogosphere community, they they did. But it was, it was definitely that imposter syndrome, something brand new, dealing with that postpartum depression. But then... I think the one thing that was helpful for me and just really helped me get out of my own way was the fact that I was sharing it. I was talking about the idea with my friends and my husband, and they would all give me positive feedback. And so that was a motivator to and a push for me to do it. I feel like if I had kept it to myself, we wouldn't we would never have met like <laughs> yeah. this conversation. None of this would ever happen. So having that accountability, sharing with other people that I trusted, right? Because not everybody is an advocate for your dreams. I remember when I first started the business, there were people who were like, oh my God, are you having money problems? What is this business? Like, <laughs> Why do you need another business in addition to your full-time job? I is mean, your photography was cute and all, but what is this? Um, <laughs> is everything okay? Yeah. And people are like, oh, it's cute. Oh, sure. I don't know what it is, but whatever. You know. And so when you get that kind of feedback, initially, you, for anybody who is struggling with imposter syndrome, you want to retreat right away. But just having those allies in my side that were like, oh, this is a great idea. You should do it. You should try it. What's the worst that could happen? You already have a full-time job. It's just a matter of time and balancing around your babies. Those are the people that really helped me make it become a reality. I want to ask you just one more question. As you know, Bola, everybody thinks about this rainbow moment. I go in and I quit my job, right? And it's going to be great. I'm going to feel awesome. Can you tell everybody how you felt when you quit your job? Um, so I worked full time and ran my photography business and started Clever World Finance all together, right? And then I transitioned out of that photography business when Clever World Finance started taking over. And I didn't quit my job until about two or two and a half years into the business that was not making any money, but it was consuming a lot of time. And I figured that if I wanted to grow this to the point where it could make money, I needed to take a break from this full-time job that was paying me a salary with a 401k. (laughs) Makes a lot of sense, right? (laughs) Yeah. Just to be clear, what you're saying is this is in no way ready to support you, but you need to make a stand here. Yeah, the first year, Clever Finance made $200. Um, 
What'd you do with all that money? That can't even buy you a full tank of gas. <laughs> Like not even ramen again. We're not even having ramen. <laughs> so I remember having, I had another friend who is a lawyer that was thinking of quitting her corporate law job to start her own law firm. And it was a constant conversation. Oh my God, you quit. No, you quit. No, you quit. So I was like, okay, I'm going to come up with a plan. I'm going to save 12 to 18 months of financial obligations so that I have a runway where I can quit my job and still do my financial obligations. And if necessary, go back to work. I saved the money, but I still couldn't quit my job. I was like, oh, my God, my 401k. I'm not going to have a 401k anymore. Oh, my God, I'm not going to get that paycheck every two weeks. And listen, getting used to not getting a paycheck and not being able to get a salary and paying other people. I got an au pair to help me with my, my twins from my savings, and she earned more than I earned. <laughs> The first year I quit, she had a salary. She had a, a all the fees that it cost to bring them over, their weekly stipend, paying for their college classes. She got all that. I got zero. She was I was working for her, um, and she was amazing, by the way. But it was really a mental mental struggle. And you know, my husband would say, "What's the worst thing that could happen? You go and find a new job. You are qualified." So I told my boss I wanted to leave, and they were just everything to do to keep me to to make me stay. They tried it. And I was like, this is a sign from God. This is me throwing away an opportunity. I'm getting all these things at work that I otherwise never have gotten. And now I want to quit my job. And I just decided to just take a leap of faith. The day I quit my job, I had heart palpitations. <laughs> I was super stressed out. I was on Indeed applying to hundreds of jobs that whole night because I thought I had made a mistake. And so as I would work on my business, I would continue applying to jobs. I went to job interviews. <laughs> But I could never accept the job. But I always had my my resume ready. You know how they say stay ready? My resume, my cover letter, everything was always yeah. ready. And I was okay. Yeah. I'm not going to get a full-time job. I can't accommodate that. But how about I look for a part-time job? <laughs> so then I started looking for part-time job just in case. <laughs> so there was no, to answer your question, there was no rainbow moment. In fact, that first year was incredibly stressful knowing that the business was not yet making any money. And even the money it made in the next 12 months barely touched my six-figure salary, but I just had to persevere and decide that the traction I was seeing was worth the continued focus on building the business. The number of times people have uh, told me that story, and that's not the story we ever hear. We hear the rainbows and unicorn story. <laughs> Bola lived happily ever Instagram. after with the twins and her husband, and now she just dances all day at Clever Girl Finance, you know, and yeah, it's as bright and sunny. Week. Yes, that's right. Sits around with her feet up. Week. Yes, everybody else does the work. I want to end with this. This is the what I learned from the end of this chapter, which is at one point or another, we all experience a stage or stages in our lives where we don't know if we're making the right decisions, but we trust our gut feeling and make the decisions anyway. This is what I did when I decided to make that crazy commute to and from New York City. And when I later decided to start yet another side hustle on top of my full-time job, despite my challenges as a new mom, each decision was scary and nerve wracking. And I would think about everything that could possibly go wrong but I realized that thinking that way would keep me dead in my tracks. It's uh, just phenomenal stuff. The book is called Choosing to Prosper, Triumphing Over Adversity, Breaking Out of Comfort Zones, Achieving Your Life and Money Dreams. Paul, I think it's available everywhere, right? Yes, everywhere. You can hear me read it to you, too. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, an audiobook. We, we love, you know, podcast listeners, we love audiobooks. So absolutely. Bolas, thanks so much for telling another part of your story to us that we haven't heard before. I think uh, that's going to help a lot of people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm Liz, the Chief Mom Officer, and when I'm not busy being the breadwinner of my family of five, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Bolas Sucumbi. And OG, you put it succinctly before, you do what you do. You got to control what you can control because that's the only thing you can control. There it is. I feel like it's a t-shirt. Does that feel like a t-shirt? Should be. Do you say TM after that one? I, I don't know why. When you just said something about the t-shirt, it reminded me of an episode of Wings where they did a crossover episode where they had Fraser Crane on Wings. Did you ever watch that? Or Oh, God. It's one of my favorite sitcoms, from, certainly from the 90s, if not ever. I love Wings. And uh, he does a whole, a whole retreat on Nantucket on the island with the wings cast and he's really just trying to sell t-shirts.
Like that's where he feels like the money is. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I'm not mistaken, I think his slogan was like, if you can see it, you can be it. Something like that. But oh my God, it's, it's a hell of an episode. TM. TM. That's fantastic. That's going back. Another old guy story there. It's not that old. That's a show from the nineties. You know how many people, you know, people that listen to the show might not have been born in, in 1993 when that show was that on. That just shows you the wide appeal we have. If we can entertain <laughs> all of the ages without the, yeah. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, oh. they put what you value first. You know what? Right now, this time of year, what I'm really valuing is finding the right crankbait that's going to pull out that 42-inch northern pike from my lake. I know he's there. Oh, just got to find the crankbait. Plus, it's fun to say crankbait. <laughs> it is fun to say crankbait. I thought you were going to say cider and donuts being there in northern Michigan. Well, we already covered that one. But, uh, Recently, we did, didn't yeah, we, we talked yeah. about He's I, on to ice fishing. It's already September. <laughs> Get with right, the times. That's right. I'm planning on my <laughs> ice fishing rig. <laughs> that's right. The four days of summer are over. <laughs> yeah. Time to go back to that. Uh, it's your loved ones in your time, but Hey, if you can spend it with your loved ones, ice fishing, that's why they may buy quality term life insurance. Actually simple. You go to stack slash Haven life now, and they'll give you free quote. They're committed to offering a modern way for you to buy life insurance. The application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. It's affordable prices and all policies are issued by mass mutual more than 160 years old. And today we're going to throw out the lifeline to our friend, Marissa. Say hi, Marissa. Hi, Joe and OG. I've been listening to you guys for at least seven years, I think, because I started around the time I started listening to Paula Pant and and listened to advice for investing in my 401k, et cetera. So now I'm actually moving to another company. And I'm wondering about my 401k for my old company, if I should roll that to a traditional IRA, do a Roth conversion a Roth 401k, or maybe move some of the money for a LERP because we are making, you know, well over six figures. And I have always looked at the possibility of retiring early. So I'm wondering, because I don't have any money, really, I have like maybe five grand at a Roth 401k from my old employer. But if I should start making sure that I have money in Roth, so I have some more, more of that tax-free money, or do some of these other options. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. I've been reading articles and I'm kind of lost in the abyss. So uh, I thought I'd turn to my old friends, Joe and OG. <laughs> thanks so much. Hey, thanks for that, Marissa. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> congratulations on a great job saving. And uh, thanks for mentioning the important people here on the show. I think that, Doug, is what you're getting to, isn't it? But just something in the you know something in my throat. You know, I don't know what that was. Poor guy. Oh, gee, you can tell Marissa's lost a little bit in the weeds because when she mentions a lerp, uh, she you're like around quite a bit. You're yeah. like, oh boy. Are those the people that go to the park on Saturdays and they they dress up and like do fake sword fights and stuff? It's a whole different concept. Closely related. These are people that dress up like advisors, but they're really insurance salespeople. No, I'm, I think. I think of long range reconnaissance patrols, a la <laughs> recon Marines, <laughs> but that's a different thing. Hoo-ah! Yeah. She's like, I was thinking about, uh, getting into war fighting. Hey, that's, Stead. that's your retirement plan. So yeah. OG and I don't know what a LERP is, Joe. Ed, ed, I, do know it. I do know what it is. Doesn't sound oh, like you do. OG definitely does. knows what it is. I definitely know what it is. He does. Let's explain to Doug what a LERP is. Uh, it is a, a generally pretty slimy product sold by life insurance salespeople disguised as an investment, and they call it the life insurance retirement plan. So set that aside for a quick moment. Back to our discussion on retirement planning earlier today. This is where this will come super, you know, come in handy because because Marissa is just like dumping money in her retirement plan, right? Like I make tons of money. I'm saving a boatload of it. I don't know where to put it. So I've just been putting my 401k for the last half dozen years. And now I'm moving to a new company. And so I'm thinking about it again. And this is the problem with, it's the good thing about 
kind of setting it, forgetting it. But it's also the bad thing about setting it for you. It's like you literally don't think about it for half of your working career. Uh, so the first thing that you want to start with is what is, you know, kind of what does this look like in terms of your retirement goals and your time frames? Because that's going to help you make decisions on where to put the money. If you're 50 and you're like, I want to retire in five years, then it doesn't matter where you put it because you can get money out of your 401k at 55. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. If you're 40 and you want to get money out of your retirement when you're 45, you have to jump through some different hoops. So you have to think about it a lot differently. And that's going to help you figure out where to put it. So yes, in your 401k, yes, in your Roth 401k, probably no. I mean, like 95% chance the answer is no on the life insurance deal. But her original question was, what do I do with my old retirement plan? Should it be in a traditional IRA? Should I roll it over to my old plan or to my new plan or leave it? And most of the time we recommend that that money should go into a traditional IRA or to a Roth IRA, depending on where the, where the money you know, started from. I wouldn't do a conversion. If you said you're making six figure income, why do you want to pay all this uh, taxes? You know, that's, that's a lot of tax bill to pay on top of your regular income. Um, so probably not the right time to be doing a conversion, but this is where kind of, you know, I hate to say it, but this is where we have all of that stuff that we were talking about earlier about thinking about what your retirement is going to look like helps make all of these decisions because maybe a Roth conversion ladder strategy does make sense. It just Maybe you're supposed to do a little bit every year for the next 10 years or something. So the answer is yes to almost all of those things, but probably no to the insurance. Here's what I struggle with, with the Roth part of that equation. Sure, that's going to give her some some tax-free money, which I definitely have an appreciation for, but I like saving that for later. You know, I don't like that to solve her early retirement problem, OG, even though Roth IRA money, she might be able to get at the principal early. I really like non-qualified money for that, like having this flexible money that she can get to whenever she wants. And I think that might be the piece. Like she asked a lot of questions about different places. I didn't hear about flexible money. And if she's going to retire pre-59 and a half, I think having a savings plan that starts building that bucket so she doesn't have to worry about the tax implications. She just spends the money when she needs to spend the money. Yeah. And to be clear, you can still get money out of your retirement plan before that. It just, there's bigger hoops to jump through and kind of a bigger PIA, definitely a uh, factor to make happen. But uh, three legs of a stool, tax-free money, taxable money, and do whatever you want money. And sounds like there's a lot of tax deferred money and probably not a lot of do whatever you want money. So, Yeah. And, uh, and the LERP, just to be clear, I think both OG and I think that that plan can work, but it's so complicated. It's so misused. I'm glad, OG, that you told her to set that aside because it is it, it, just understanding how that works is a PhD. Just to kind of frame it out for somebody that might be thinking about it, I would want to see somebody have all of their retirement plan contributions done. And by that, I mean like yours and your partners or spouses, workplace plans, yours and your partners, IRAs, all of that flexible money that we were talking about before. And I'm talking about not like, well, I'm putting a thousand a month in my brokerage account. Is that cool? No, I mean, like you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're saving tens of thousands of dollars on a monthly basis into that. And then, and only then once all of those, all of those buckets are overflowing, does that even maybe sort of kind of get in the conversation? And even then I would say there's got to be another reason for it. Unless you're super de duper de rich, probably the only person you're going to make rich on this deal or the only person that's going to get rich on a life insurance deal is the life insurance person. So probably pass. D- yeah. Hey, thanks for that question, Marissa. If you've got a question for us, head to uh, stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. And uh, for being brave and asking a question on air, Marissa's getting the Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt, the Haven Lifeline Circus tee, which is just... That's just fan. I'm so happy for her. That's just amazing. It's the best one of all. Easily the best That's one great. of all. great. Doug, do you have that shirt? Just, I don't have that. I, don't, I haven't seen it. I've never laid eyes on it, but I hear it's... I mean, I'm just so happy that she gets a shirt. It's amazing. It's good. StackyBenjamins.com slash voicemail. Hey, and that's going to do it for today, he said, segueing quickly. Uh, thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this show. Uh, Mom's putting those on the fridge. And uh, whenever the Bridge Club comes over, 
It's always uh, fun to see mom bragging about the little show here, OG. If you're looking for surround sound, of course, we have our Facebook group, The Basement. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash basement for that. We also have the 201, and increasingly, we're doing live events on Instagram, on YouTube, on Fireside. These are smaller events. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash 201, and people that sign up for our newsletter, we send them uh, whenever we're going live. They'll get an indication that we're going live as well. So if you want to hang out with us on any of these, join the 201, stackybenjamins.com slash 201. But if you're not here for surround sound or to help us out with a review, although we love both of those things, if you're here because you're concerned, not just about the market or chatter around recession, but about your own plan, OG and his team put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. This guide will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to stackybenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide, and you'll get this helpful free guide from OG. So thanks for that, OG. All right. I think that puts a pin in Monday. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take some advice from Bola Sukunbi. Look at where you can choose to prosper in your life and make the sacrifices you need to to make it happen. Second, saving into your 401k at work. Realize that while saving is great, planning what you'll do in retirement is the step that will make those plans a success. But the big lesson? Make sure when you have a great idea like Bola did with Clever Girl Finance, you know, you just sit on it for like a year. Wait, what? That was not the message. Gotcha. Thanks to Bola Sukunbi for joining us today. You'll find her new book, Choosing to Prosper, wherever books are sold. Also, find out more about her work at www.bolasukunbi.com. That's B-O-L-A-S-O-K-U-N-B-I.com. And of course, Clever Girl Finance. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Guys, big fans of fondue. Yeah. Not really. No.
No. No, no, really? The only fondue I've ever had is the melted cheese. I know there's so many other kinds of fondues and there's restaurants that go crazy with all the, I've only ever had the melted cheese. And after a while, it just gets boring and it's a lot of work. You are a fan of national parks though. You do like national parks. I know Doug, you do. No, I don't actually. You don't like national parks. You're not a fan of national parks. There have only been a couple that I do like because I don't like that they're so crowded. So I love to go to some of the state parks and and just and get out to some of the less marquee places. Well, I'm glad you said that because there was a guy I met at Yellowstone and I was complaining to him about how crowded it was. And he had a rule, which has generally been true, not always true, but generally true, unless you're going on big holiday weekends, which is he calls it the hundred yard rule, which is actually go a hundred yards down a trail and you will go from a bajillion people at Yellowstone to not very many. Yeah, I know. We've covered this quite a bit. And I the rule works. He's right. And I've had that work everywhere except Glacier uh, has that worked for me. So and, and and or if you can get to like an Isle Royal or to uh, what is it? The Dry Tortugas. I think that is that the, the National Park I, Island. in problem with Dry Tortuga is when I went there, it was packed because you're on a boat that is full of people and they all get off the boat at the same time. They all get back on the boat. So you are, don't be wrong. It's not a mass huge amount of people, but it's not, you know, it's not a very big place. Right. So, well, some of the harder to get to ones, I know there's a few in, in Alaska that are nearly impossible to get to those, but even the, the hundred yard rule doesn't work that well for me because just getting into the park, all the lines, getting the parking, And that, you know, trying to find, got a Rocky Mountain National Park. You're just trying to find a place to put your car is nearly impossible. And it just, it taints the whole thing for, even though, yeah, okay, now I've gone two miles into nature and yeah, I've left behind most of the people. I'm just, I can't shake that feeling of the mall at Christmas time. Man, I got to tell you, then you would like the park I just went to. I should shut up about it. So it doesn't, doesn't end up like what you're talking about, but we just got back from Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And there's two sides, the north side, which is incredibly rugged and has this phenomenal trail that we did five miles along. And it goes from these things called coolies, these little breaks in the badlands get really deep in a hurry um, all the way up to the top where you're along the ridge. And you get a 360 view where you've got, you know, uh, 300 feet down on both sides of the trail. Just a beautiful trail and nobody out there in the north part. And then you go to the south part. There's a few more people, still not super crowded. We were there Labor Day weekend, not not that crowd at all. And tons, tons of, we had to stop our car because a wild horse was crossing the road. Was, That's might cool. have been a National Parks highlight. Autumn and I, at night, my daughter and I went out stargazing. She loves photography. And so we set up, because it's super dark, obviously out in North Dakota, she sets up and we've got a great view of the of the Milky Way above us. We just pack up and we're walking away from this really dark site and the sky just lights up. I had never seen the Northern Lights before. And it was so, have you guys seen the Northern Lights? Never have. And, yeah. and they've actually been hitting, coming down further south this summer more than they have in a long time. And it used to be really rare to be able to see them even in Northern Michigan and, and now- People are seeing them like almost every week, every other week. It was incredible. We tried to see him the next day. Cheryl wasn't with us. She had gone to bed early because she had a huge migraine. So she went out the next day and uh, we got one of those apps that said the possibility of seeing one. And we get out there and we're seeing the beautiful sky and it's awesome. But then we pull up the app to see, okay. And it says, you have a 1% chance no. of, see- of seeing the Northern Lights tonight. So she didn't, she didn't get to see them. But this little tiny town that uh, celebrates uh, Theodore Roosevelt is called Medora. Long story behind that. But this town is so into the history of the area and the fun of the area that they have this thing called the musical. And people just kept saying to us, like, oh, you going to the musical? Turns out the musical is North Dakota's biggest tourist attraction. No idea. Had never heard of it. It's this outdoor amphitheater. And if you've ever been to uh, a regional theme park, with your parents when you were like nine and they made you sit through one of those shows with college kids dancing. (laughs) Like that's kind of what the musical is all about. It is uh, lots of fun, patriotic stuff and aw shucks humor and 
just, it was, it was just, it was this really fun kind of cheesy night. But the reason I ask you if you like fondue is because beforehand you could purchase a steak dinner that, uh, uh, all of a sudden we got OG's attention. Oh, steak dinner. I'm in. Which was fondue steak. And I never had, fo- here's what fondue yeah, steak no. is in North, Do you, you know what it is? I mean, it's like going to melting pot and doing it yourself, right? Nope, it's not at all. That's what I thought it was going to be. I'm like, no. oh, that sounds good. Nope. What they do is they take these big 12 ounce steaks, they shove them on a pitchfork, they fondue them in these barrels of oil. They just shove the pitchfork in the oil and then they pull it out and you get these steaks with these big holes in them where the pitchfork went through. You eat them on this little tin plate with uh, with all the fixings and uh, a guy singing country music. Fond dude steak. Sounds like deep fried steak. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> I think they're like deep fried. Yeah, deep fried steak isn't going to fly, Earl. What are we going to do instead? And we got to come up with it, but we'll call it fond dude. It's fond dude. I mean, technically, just like that cheese, fancy melting pot restaurant. But Doug, go to go to Theodore Roosevelt. I think you'd super. It, it, it was unbelievable. Well, not now. You just. Uh, all 190,000 of our listeners are on their way there right now. That's the last one I'm going to. It's fabulous. 